Welcome to the Richmond Area Historical and Genealogical Society's first Richmond History Chronicles. Uh, today we're going to be talking to Joe Maranzano. Hello, Joe. Hi, Norm. How you doing? Pretty good. Joe's lived uh, in the area here most all of his life, which has been a long one. And we're going to talk about him growing up and uh, what it was like to be on the railroad. Uh, where were you? Where were you born, Joe? Detroit, Michigan. Okay. I understand that your parents are from the old country. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're from Italy, actually Sicily. Sicily. Yeah. So they were Sicilian. Yeah. Okay. When did they come over here? My dad came over in 1913. 1913. 1913. My mother came over about the same time. Yeah. When were you born? I was born. My my birthday was May the 3rd, 1928. So you're older than sliced bread then, aren't you? Well, you know, I was glad to get sliced bread when I was a kid. That was the year that they started slicing bread, actually. Uh, what kind of work did you do growing up? I mean, what, as a kid, what, well, what were some of, the, some of the things you did? Well, I was born in Detroit. Mm -hmm. But I come out here, my dad brought me out here in, when I was about 12 years old. Okay. After the depression, start going down. My dad was laid off for eight years from Budwheel, so after the depression, he went back to work. And one day he came home and he said, Ma, we're going to move to a farm. And she was a city girl. She, well, he said, I farmed all my life in the old country. He said, I'm not going through this again. And he <laughs> said, I'm going to buy a farm. <laughs> So he brought me out here when I was about 12 years old. Okay. Then I had to work. Yeah, and, and you're telling me that uh, that the farm that you bought, or your father bought, uh, was what, $1,600? $1,600. And that was how many acres was 80 that? 80 acres. 80 acres. And a, a beautiful house, but didn't have no lights and didn't have anything. Mm-hmm. And when my mother seen that, she says, we're not buying this place. We're not buying this place. No lights, no furnace, no stove. He had a wood stove, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, then finally he put her in. He got this in, and I remember one time when the guy come out there, he says, how are you going to put lights in it? He says, well, he says, we'll put lights the Edison people, mm -hmm. he says, but you're going to take five poles, and you got to pay for every pole, every other pole. And I do remember that we had five poles there, and it cost us a hundred dollars just for the poles. And I said, my God, a hundred dollars. That was a lot of money, wasn't oh, it? Oh my God, well, you only pay sixteen hundred for the farm, $100 a pole. <laughs> and then we got Carl's Electric. He wired that whole house for $65. Wow. And, uh, and I often think about that $65 as today's rate. They get that much an hour. Yeah, I was going to say the, the truck. He, for, the truck that shows yeah. up gets sixty-five bucks. Then my mother was happy. She had her lights. Yeah. Next thing my dad had to work on was getting a stove back there. We had no gas, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, "Well, you get we should call fill gas, them little tanks." Mm -hmm. So he found one of those, got her in there. Now that did make her happy. Yeah. Except when she baked bread, if we run out of gas, somebody had to run outside and flip the tank <laughs> over to get the tank on. Yeah. We had two jugs out there. Yeah, you wouldn't want to quit baking in the yeah. middle of the <laughs> well, middle of the thing, would you? It, we survived. We survived. Yeah. Over. Yeah. So that you can your family came out here at the end of the depression. Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, when you were working on that farm, I'm, I'm assuming you work you worked the farm. Oh yes, oh yes. And if I remember correctly, something about you used horses, didn't you? Oh, oh my God, we used horses. I was, by the time we got the horses, I was maybe 13 years old. I'm only five foot five. And they taught me how to use the horses and so on and so forth. Of course, I worked with the guy that had it. He had an old team. And that old plow would come up to here. I mean, I'm out there trying to plow. And I want to get this norm right now. I used to plow an acre a day. One acre a day. One acre a day with them horses. Oh my gosh. And I, I always kept, Pa, we gotta get a tractor. And he said, no, we're not gonna get a tractor. You he told, said, you, I got you. <laughs> and he told me, he said, you know, Joe, he said, I'll tell you. He said, you get a tractor. He says, and when he has to poop, I mean the tractor, mm -hmm. Drop some oil on the ground. Mm -hmm. You'll never grow anything on it. Mm -hmm. But when the horse poops, we got the fertilizer. <laughs> yeah. I, I could understand that. <laughs> you know, I said, but I could only plow so much. He says, well, he said, we'll survive. So then I said, I'll get a tractor. But if you plowed uh, an acre a day and you had an 80, 80 acre farm, not all of it's yeah. go, uh, not all of it's going to be tilled, but uh, you'd spend half the year, it seemed like, well, it, plowing it. Well, I'm glad we had maybe ten acres of pasture. Yeah, you know, if we had seven acres of of vegetables. Okay. Well, that wasn't too bad. You know, and, and we we had maybe ten acres of hay, so I wasn't plowed all the time. I mean, you plowed a lot. Yeah, it, you have some uh, cows and stuff. Oh too? yes, yes, yeah. we had cows, uh, and that's what I mean. I started working after thirteen, twelve to thirteen, because first you had a couple, then we end up. We never had a big farm. The most we ever milked was maybe a dozen cows. That's still a lot. That's seven days a week. Yeah, that's still a lot of work. And yeah. So, um, you had some military experience, didn't you? Oh, yeah. I had uh, 39 years in the military, uh, most of it National Guards. Mm hmm. And I. I end up starting as a, a private, mm -hmm. and when I finished the military, I got out of the National Guards during the Detroit riot in the 60s. Mm -hmm. That's when I retired. Yeah. And of you, course, you rose the National Guards, I only had to go weekends and Every Monday night for years, I had to go every Monday night. You re you you rose up in the ranks some. You didn't end up as I a private. Was, I end up with first sergeant. First sergeant. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I was first sergeant, and, and I had a lot of farm boys around here would come to join the National Guard. They knew me, and when they got in, they get the National Guard. And, they knew who you were. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And they still joined. Pardon? <laughs> and they still joined. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They 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 love their first sergeant. <laughs> Don't go around Sergeant Dago. That's what they used to call me. Yeah. That's Sergeant Dago. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and he said he can get mad. He said like a banny rooster. <laughs> he, he might not be big, but he said he wants to fight right now. <laughs> Of course, the army is a lot different than days and is today. Yeah. You can't even raise your voice today. I I, I can't understand that. You know, yeah. I said, how can they get disciplined? <laughs> well, I don't know if they got disciplined in the army. Didn't well, they? it's it's different today. Yeah. You know, 
Yeah. Um, well, you didn't. You weren't just doing military service, and you got off the farm and you yeah. went to work for the railroad. How did you end no, up? No, 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 no. no. no? Nineteen. Yeah. Right after the war, I got to work for Chrysler's Mopar oh. at here in Marysville. Ah. But before I went to work for Chrysler's, I worked on Detroit making parachutes during the war. Okay. I worked a farm during the war. I worked the front, uh, making parachutes on uh, Seven Mile and Hoover mm -hmm. down Detroit on the east side. Okay. And we, when we made parachutes, I walked. My well, the reason I got in there, my aunt worked there. She she sold parachutes. Mm -hmm. So she said, "Well, you come down there and work." You can stay at the grandma's, and you can still go on the farm. Mm -hmm. I said, I said, I, I don't know all about this. And my dad said, you go to work, grandma's. Uh, you go to work it over there, making mm -hmm. parachutes. You can stay at grandma a couple days a week. Says that I'll pick you up. He worked a bud wheel. Mm -hmm. He said, we go home, then we could, Still, when he had a couple cows then, and, this, mm. and I was a great experience making parachutes. Don't you could walk in that building. There was my cousin and I, and another old gentleman I can't think of his name. The only men. The rest was women sewing up parachutes. But I was lucky enough that I'd work on a Sunday. And we go out to Detroit, 10 mile in Grasset area. And they had a little airport. And we checked parachutes. They take up what, every parachute, every thousand parachutes. Number one, you go out there at 10 mile, seven mile in them mm -hmm. areas, and you drop them. And us two boys will be out there Chase those parachutes when hit the ground, deflate them. You know what I mean? And, and pack them back and up. They, and they, the inspector would say, "Yeah, that's a good one." <laughs> and I thought to myself, one out of a thousand. If it didn't open, they'd refuse. That thousand. Yeah. Yeah. But how about number three? Is that going to open? <laughs> yeah. You know, and yeah. all I can think is poor guys up there. You know, yeah. And I did that for a couple of years, and I've never seen one that failed. So, but I yeah. still had my mind. You know, they're out here, we're out there checking. But what about if the guys out there jumping? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, then, when you got when you got done with that, when I got done, I went to work. That's after the war. I mm -hmm. went to work for Chrysler's. Okay. I worked there, and it seemed like every couple of months I'd get laid off. Then I got married. I got married young. Mm -hmm. So I just got married. And I'm going to build my house. My dad says, I'll help you with the house. He gave me three acres. He, I built a house, started built the house. I got the frame up and everything else. And they laid me off. I said, holy cow, now I'm laid off. You know, and I got my house started. And there they are. My dad mm -hmm. said, don't worry. So I go to the unemployment office in uh, Port Yarn. I go sign up. He says, oh, yeah, you're laid off. And they knew Christ was laid off for all one stand, stand in line. And he says, well, you get $20 a week. $20 a week, I'm thinking to myself. Hold on, wait a minute. You're married. We're going to give you $22 a week. Now this was in 
1949, that's when I started my house. Yeah. I got married in 48. I started my house six months later. I got married in October. Mm -hmm. I says, okay. So I signed up, and I said, I can't do this. So I go to Columbus. I used to work there as a kid, mm -hmm. shoveling coal, rolling the elevator at Lambs, and then we moved to Columbus. And I walked, I said, Morris, I said, you got any worker for me? He said, yeah, Joe, I got a job. You go out shoveling coal and run the mill. Help us run the mill when you're out shoveling coal. How much you pay? He said, $35 a week. I said, well, that's still not enough. I said, but it's, it's better than 20. It's better, yeah, than the 22. So I started shoveling coal. And I'm out there shoveling coal one day, and I see this motor car go back and forth on a railroad. Of course, I've seen the motor car a lot. Yeah. Because my, that railroad split our farm. So he stopped it, and he says, hey, kid. He says, we like the way you work. He said, would you like to work on a railroad? I said, I can't. i got to go back to cars because I'm laid off. He says, well, he said, it's only part-time here. It's only summer house. I said, well, well, how about you pay? He said, $50 a week. I said, oh, my God, I <laughs> ran into Scene Morris. I said, Morris, I'm, this railroad's going to give you a job. I said, I want to work the railroad for $50 a week. Morris says, go, son, go right now. Yeah. He says, don't worry about it. So... I started working on the railroad, pick and shovel, grunt work. And I liked the railroad, but I couldn't see a career with a pick and shovel. And I'll tell you the story, though. We were sitting at just this side of Smith's Creek, and we had to take off, take the motor car off, and because here it comes with an inspection car. And I, I was sitting there eating my lunch out there. We ate lunch outside. You didn't, you didn't go to the restaurant. You ate right where you stopped. Took the motor car off, let the trains go, and just ate. Then here comes this inspection car. And the foreman sitting over there. And the other guys all sitting around there. I said, Hey, Paul, his name was Paul. See that car? Yeah. I said, someday I'm going to ride that car. He said, you little dago, you'll never get in that car. <laughs> he knew I was a farm boy, you know, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Minimum education. Yeah. I just got the ninth grade and that was it. Yeah. I had a farm. I had... Of course, we had no buses to go to school to begin with. Yeah. And I lived out there and I had 10 miles. Yeah. So that's, I, well, I started my career there. And said, because that grunt work wasn't for me. Yeah. That pick and shovel wasn't for me. There's no career in that. Yeah, no one. But it worked out, though. Okay, then. How did you go from pick and shovel? I mean, what did you do next? Well, it comes out there. They're starting to lay rail at Columbus, right where the depot was, okay. to pour yarn. Okay. So the old man come by there, and he says, can you read and write? And he insulted me. I didn't have much of an education. But he insulted me. I said, what are you talking about? Of course, we had Spaniards on there. Mm -hmm. We had Dagos on there. And yeah. I'll call them Dagos because <laughs> I won myself. And nobody could read or write. And they needed an assistant foreman. I said, yeah. I said, well, he says, how about me put you on as assistant foreman? I said, I don't know nothing about it. Steel work. I was cutting the shovel. Mm -hmm. And I was laying rail. We'll teach you. I said, well, if you're ready to go there. And not only that, Norm, 
Now my pay would go to about fifty-five dollars a week. <laughs> a big, so big increase. I, 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 I was really up there. I was number one. <laughs> of course, it helped that I could speak Italian. Yeah, you can talk to your workers. Yeah, and I could understand the Mexican to the Spaniards. Yeah. You know, yeah. In that, Spanish. In that. Yeah. But that's and I started there, and then. The gang moved out, so another guy moves in, and he says, I said, well, I don't know this. We're going to surface track. We're going to teach you. Well, that's the way my life started. I started on that gang, that gang, and then it so happened, the foreman, Paul, moved to another job, I think it was Waterford or something like that. Mm -hmm. So they needed a foreman on a Smith Creek. Now this is a year later, you know. Mm -hmm. And they said, bid on it. So I said, bid on it. I said, here I only got two years seniority. I'm going to bid on a foreman job. I'll never get out of second foreman. Mm -hmm. He said, bet on it. I said, yeah. I said, I'll bet on that because that paid pretty good money. You know what I mean? Well, how much? Would, it, yeah. would that movie you up know, to well, 60, was, 60 well, bucks? I got, <laughs> I, I got the temporary foreman job. Mm -hmm. While I was waiting for the bids all go, I was running the gang. <clears throat> and I remember like it was today, I got something like $268 a month. So that's how I yeah, got that. Yeah, yeah. So that worked out. And I held a job for, well, I held it up to 1958 when, the, when I went down Detroit. But meantime, that was good money. Mm -hmm. I, then they shut my plant down, shut the, not the plant, but the section down. Mm -hmm. Instead of running 24 miles or 14 miles, we just had Richmond, and Mount Clemens was the only depots was open, only sections. So the, I was forced to Detroit, and I said, "Oh my God, I can't go down there to work. I can't go down." Well, you're still living out here. Yeah. Well. I was forced to go down there. So I went down there. And I went to work down at, right downtown, Brush Street Depot. Now you might not remember Brush Street Depot, a lot of people wouldn't remember Brush Street Depot, but the Renaissance right now, GM building and all that, that's where my tool house was. And we used to ferry cars across the the river. Ferry cars across the river. Had seven passenger trains a day. A lot of freight. Oh my God! I said, took a kid from the farm, brought him down there. I was scared to death. I mean, I was scared to death. We had steam engines running down there. Mm -hmm. If you was and the steam engines you wouldn't get out of your way then. You got out of their way. Right. Or else you was history. Yeah. And it scared me. Yeah. But I survived. And then I worked my way through there. And I loved the city then. Mm -hmm. But I was still driving back and forth. And that's quite a ways, and, really, considering yeah. the roads and whatnot. Well, I'll give you a good example why this kid was so scared. I had nine turnouts, nine switches from Richmond to Fort Yer. When I took over Brush Street, I had 325 switches. All you could see is those red signals going like that. And I said, my God, I can't do that. You know, I was scared of you. Well, we'll, we'll teach you. We'll teach you. Were those those manually switched? Is you know, three hundred and twenty-five? They was manual. 
manual switches. Yeah, you had to turn them, turn them by hand. And so you had to get down through there and, and, yeah. and turn them. Yeah. That is a lot. But they, they was always set for the main line. Mm -hmm. And uh, we was fortunate enough to have, from Brush Street all the way up to Eastern Marker, we had a sidetrack. The, that's where the Stroh's Brewery was, and all them companies were all down there. I used to go around up to Brush Street. Mm -hmm. It was three and a half miles. And another funny story was, not really funny, but the actual story, was before the passenger would go down there in the morning, we had seven commuters coming in, plus the main line trains. They wouldn't run that track at night in, in the morning, unless the commuters would we go out there and have to flash you in. Track is clear, go on in. Because it was all overhead in great separation, and they wouldn't come down from Eastern Market to the Brush Street Depot unless the track was clear. Not clear for trains. Debris is the people you throw off the the uh, over overpasses. Oh. Joseph Campo and all those. There was all overpasses. So you had to check and make sure there was yeah. nothing on the track. I had to go seven days a week in the morning. You know, during the week was all right. I was in there because the mm -hmm. first pasture was seven o'clock mm -hmm. would come in, and we'd have to walk that and clear the train. He would come down because there there might even be an automobile down there, an old body they would throw on the tracks. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it was it, it was it was interesting. Yeah. Now you continued to to move up the ranks and. You well, needed some additional training, didn't you? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I uh, I was working there one day. And the the old man come over there, and he says, "Joe, we want you." And we got Phil of the uh, International Correspondence School in Phil in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. We want you to take a correspondence course in engineering. I said. And I remember, like, what's the day, Norm? Two hundred seventy dollars. And I said, I can't afford that. I can't afford. By that time, I had three little children, four little children. I said, I can't afford that. Hmm. He said, Don't worry. Who said anything about money? He said, It's going to cost you two hundred seventy dollars, but we'll take care of the bill. I, I said, Oh well, I'll try it. He says, and he spoke broken English, you know. Mm -hmm. He said, what's the matter with you? <laughs> he said, we give him the break. He said, you don't want to do it. He says, come on, come on, I'll take care of you. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I took the course, but oh, it was tough, Lord. It that was, was the engineering, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. It was engineering. And you're taking a correspondence course, which is like going to college or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it was like junior college. Or, it, it was, I'll tell you, I, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out. In engineering, they had all these courses. You start with math. Mm -hmm. You go all the way through. And he come up there, and I'm reading over here. If a steamboat is going so many knots in our rail, <laughs> and the wind is blowing here and, and there, I said, what am I going to worry about a steamboat? I'm working on the railroad. <laughs> you know, I said, what, what the heck? And it was tough. Yeah, and you only had a ninth grade education, yeah. right? And you were and you were taking college classes, basically. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I guess so. That's what they told them was. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I made it. Yeah. It was hard. And I remember the wife used to say, don't bother your dad tonight. I had either Monday or Tuesday. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I go Monday to the guard and sometimes he just weakens. Mm -hmm. Don't bother your dad. Tonight he's studying. And they wouldn't come, you know. And I'd study. Then I'd send the class and oh my God, yeah. was it tough. Yeah. But it was worth it. So now I, I got this. And I work it around. The old man took me out of uh, Brush Street. He said, I'm going to give you the gang, the big gang. 
Well, I was scared then. Now I know it. I know how to make turnouts and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. So I'm going to give you the big gang. So I got the big gang. So I run in big projects, industrial projects, all all to a built on like if Ford wanted to switch in, I would run over there and put it in for you know, or another company wants, so I put it in. You had to calculate things like curves and oh, stuff yeah. like that. It, it, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. and it was a challenge. Then they put I-75 in to Detroit. Mm -hmm. And I had to put all the, we had to build the road. We had to build what we call shoe flies where they're going to, so we could run our railroad around it while they're building the, the viaducts. Mm -hmm. So I'd go up and build those, run the train around them. When the viaduct got done, the overhead, you push that on the, the viaduct, and you build the other drill. <laughs> it, it was interesting. Yeah. So one day the old man comes up to me, and I call him the old man. Well, he's the boss. Not only the boss, he was 70 years old. So he come up to me, he says, Joe, he says, they fired me. I said, they fired you? Yeah, they told me I can't work after the first of the month because I'm going to be 71. Oh. They want you to be a supervisor. I says, want me to be a supervisor? Yeah. They want you for either my job or Papa's job. Papa was a guy who had Pontiac. So I said, well, I'm not going to Pontiac. I said, I'm not going to Pontiac. I said, because I'm driving with three guys to Detroit. They mm -hmm. helped me with the bill. Mm -hmm. He says, I said, I can't afford it. He says, what if we give you a truck or a pickup? Mm -hmm. I said, that'd be nice. Would you go? I said, well, I want, I want, I wanted this line right here, right in Richmond. Yeah. No. Nope. He says, you go to Richmond. He said, but you go from Richmond to Jackson on the airline. Well, okay. I said, can I drive the truck home, you said? I said, okay. But I still got to put gas. Who told you about the gas? He said, you drive the truck. <laughs> you drive it home, we take care of everything. <laughs> I couldn't refuse, Lord. No, how could you? I couldn't refuse. He made you that offer, you couldn't refuse, <laughs> <Yeah>. huh? <laughs> I said, well, okay. Of course, the guys who was riding me with Richmond, from Richmond <laughs> to Detroit, <laughs> they was mad. Yeah, they're hurting now. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I, I got the Pontiac, and then I did, I was successful. Mm-hmm. Anytime they had a problem, I could come up with fixing it. Mm -hmm. And if it had a wreck, you know, I'd go over there. Had no problem. Finally, they said, you know what? Because no matter where they had, if they had a wreck or someplace on the railroad, they sent me. Mm -hmm. How many wrecks did you go to? Do you, I, no, mean, I couldn't count them. You couldn't count them, huh? Could, I couldn't count them. Mm -hmm. uh, there were hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. and there was little ones and there was bad ones. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember one time in Pontiac, the guy run the light. Mm. An engineer run the light at Woodward. He run the signal, I'll call him, but I he figured one of those lights. And he, he run the signal. He run head on with a train coming out of Johnson mm. Avenue Yard. That's the worst one. I always remember that because I had to go pick up the engineers. <laughs> and, 
It was bad, though. Oh, yeah, I imagine. I had two yeah. engineers die. Yeah. And I, I remember picking up his watch. Oh, boy. Boy, that's, that's tough. That's tough. And, that's tough. But I got through that. Yeah. And I had some real bad ones. Yeah. And I had some that looked bad, just the equipment. Yeah. Yeah. But nobody got hurt. Yeah. But this one was, I oh, always remember oh, that. Man. man. It was good friends of mine. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. But then, from then on, no matter where the wreck was, I was supervisor in Pontiac. I had 200 miles of railroad to take care of, had the Pontiac yard, Fisher Body yard, and all that. And I took care of it. So that finally they start running me to these wrecks. And then I said, no, 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 no. I'm enough. I got Pontiac to take care of. Mm -hmm. Who's taking care of my yard? Sometime I'd be gone for three, four days. Mm -hmm. So they well, we can fix that. You ain't going to have a yard no more. We're going to give you production engineer. So that meant all production work on the railroad, putting in ties, putting in rails, grinding, and all that stuff was my responsibility. Well, I took care of that. Yeah. And don't forget, your wreck master. <laughs> you got the wrecks too, but the production gang wasn't bad. I get them started, go go check on them, make sure they made production, made schedules out, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I had an office at 131 West Lafayette. You won't find it anymore. That's a parking garage now. <laughs> it was a 10-story building. <laughs> it's a parking garage because I wasn't looking for that one time. Yeah. I said, yeah. what happened to the office? It's cool. Yeah. That's a parking garage. And he showed me, there's a garage. Then yeah. I went to Brewery Park. But anyway, I worked wrecks. Mm -hmm. No matter where they was, I, was gonna, I worked wrecks in Chicago, east of Chicago, mm -hmm. not in the town of Chicago. 51st Street, Oliver Yard. Yeah. And then and I, I worked all these, and I, then I said, now you're going to do the office work as a production engineer. We had about a $30 million schedule for the summer work. Mm -hmm. And I figured out how many ties they needed per mile and all, all that stuff. And I did that for a long time, and I remember my wife telling me one time, Joe, don't take any more promotions, because every time you take a promotion, you're always gone. <laughs> you know, it used to be just overnight. Then yeah. it only got to be a week at a time, you yeah. know what I mean? So I, says, I said, don't worry. I only got 15 years to go, I'll be pensioned off. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so the, she said, yeah, yeah, she said, yeah, you never hope. Only on weekends, you know, if we didn't have a wreck. Yeah, if you didn't have a wreck. Yeah. yeah. So that, I went through that. Well, did you get another promotion or did I you? I got to be engineer track. Engineer of track? Engineer track is, I had all the railroad to worry about. And it wasn't only Michigan. I had Ohio. I've been... Had, went to Ohio, to Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. I went to Kentucky. You know, I didn't go very far in Kentucky because on the DT and I, once you went through the tunnel, about five miles was more track than that was the end of Kentucky. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> then I went to. I had the Detroit to Little Shoreline. I had the DT and I, and I had the, all this. But, Man. and I did all the scheduling, all the budget work, and everything for that. And these guys could figure out, here's a guy that only went to Gandhi, we used to call him Gandhi's, mm -hmm. section man, went up there. He's got an engineering degree through a correspondence course, mm -hmm. and he's the second 
in command of the engineering department on all his career road. And ninth grade education yeah. plus uh, yeah. correspondence. And Norm, if I could have had an engineering di diploma, you know, from a major school, mm -hmm. I could have been chief engineer. Yeah. And it all started with the question, can you read or write? Right. That's right. And you, even though you were insulted, the fact that you could read and write. In fact, and I, you know, Norm, I always said the old man, his name was Zoli. Mm -hmm. He shortened it up when he come here from Italy, you know. Cucazzoli was his name, mm -hmm. and he couldn't live with that. <laughs> <laughs> so he showed it up to Zoli. <laughs> so he got me there, and I think of that old man all the time. <laughs> that is quite a career. Now, you got a hold of the of the Columbus Depot. Oh yeah. And how did how did you come about co get coming up with that? Well, Norm. Columbus Depot was, it was closed. They still, was, wasn't stopped, we call it. Mm -hmm. the train would stop at the depot if you flagged them down or you wanted to get off. But anyway, that used to be your way station. When it rained or anything like that, mm -hmm. we'd go in there and eat this little shanty. Mm -hmm. and so, so they wanted to get rid of it. After I left, I was, I was already in all Detroit. They said, we're going to get, it, get rid of it, get, get a tax roll. So I said, you know, that's a, make a pretty good check for me. And of course, I only lived a quarter of a mile from there. And you wanted a place to store stuff. Yeah. So I called, told the wife, I said, I get that depot. And she says, OK. What are you going to do with it? I said, I don't know. I was going to just put tools in it, make a, mm -hmm. like a garage or some mm -hmm. storage shed. She said, you know, I don't want that to happen. She said, I want you to get the depot. I said, yeah, okay. She said, but she says, you're not going to make a storage place out of it. I said, what do you mean? She says, we're going to set it up in our yard. And because she go, we drove by it every day, put it on a regular, mm -hmm. on rattle run. Mm -hmm. I says, okay. So I always collected stuff, you know. I had lights. I had all kind of railroad melabilia. Yeah. So she says, I said, why? She says, Ma used to drive the train from Richmond, from Columbus to Richmond, because she went to high school, and she used to work for Mrs. Cook and get her room and board. Mm -hmm. And she grabbed that train on Sunday afternoon, go to Richmond, spend all week, and she'd come home Friday on the train. Mm -hmm. Ma, I talked to Ma, and she said she wants to keep the depot. Okay, and we drug it home. Well, I say drug it home. There's a story in itself. <laughs> I, I go over and she's the neighbors. You know, Mrs. Polka, Mr. Pierce. So I, if I grab that depot, I said, can I drag it through your farm? Oh, yeah, Joe, just do what you want. So I jacked her up. My father-in-law had a 99, Oliver 99. He said, yeah, you can use that. So we went out to his woods. We cut some nice-sized trees down, made skids out of them. We didn't trim them up or that. We just chopped down. It had to be 20 feet long. We cut them. Got her all up in the air. I had the railroad jack, you know, I had all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, you had the got tools. Got her up in the air, yeah. got her all ready, and the cop stopped me. How are you going to get that thing across Rattle Rum? I said, drag it. You were dragging that thing across Rattle Rum. So 
so he forced me to go see the guy by the name of Davis. I never forget his name. I had a four year in Marysville. Mm -hmm. I said, How much do you want to move my depot? He said, You got her up in the air already. Why don't you move it? I said, I can't. I told him what the, the order yeah, said, yeah. I couldn't do it. Yeah. He said, I'll give you $200, I'll take it over there. So I took it over there. Yeah. And he, instead of me dragging it, I run into the drag. I had a whole plan, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't let me drag it across. Mm -hmm. and the liability, I can understand what they were Yeah, about. some car come in or yeah. something like that. You'd have to have the road shut down, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. That's if, because you lost the chimney, Norm. I had to take the chimney off, <laughs> clear the lines. <laughs> and then put it, put it back on. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Yeah. You paid a lot for that depot, didn't you? Pardon? You paid a lot for that depot, Oh, didn't yeah, you? I give a dollar. Yeah, a whole big dollar. A whole big dollar. <laughs> now, that was that was located at uh, Rattle Run, where the tracks cross Rattle right. Run. That was on the, which corner was that on again? Well, that would be on the southwest corner. Southwest or corner. Else, because our, our railroad directions, I always get messed up. Mm -hmm. That's east or west. Because mm -hmm. they run east to west, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, but yeah. If then, if we on our west corner, southwest corner. Yeah. Now, originally that little place there. I mean, they had a farmer's elevator. They had a general store. Oh, we store. had the farmer's elevator. Not the farmers. It was uh, Shannon had the elevators. Columbus mm -hmm. elevator. We called. Yeah, it. yeah. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then there was Matt Burke across the street that had the general store and the post office. And didn't he run the, did he run the depot too? Was he like? Yeah, his son, Tom, run the depot, not run the depot. He was the one who would go pick up the mail. Mm -hmm. And then, because the train would come by, and they had an arm out there, mail receiver, and she throw the mail off on the, on the fly. Mm -hmm. that I don't want to bring it back in. Yeah. Yeah, I think, again, you know, you mentioned whistle stopped, and uh, to elaborate on that a little bit, that just basically meant that if there was no business to be done there, yeah. they would just blow the whistle well, and keep on going. Well, when it started, Norm, I don't know where year they quit, but there was a regular schedule. Your passenger train would stop. Mm -hmm. Then, after they semi closed the depot, you mm -hmm. could still go in the depot, but there was nobody there. You flagged them. A mm -hmm. passenger, you flagged them. Okay. You would go out there, they had a flag sitting out there, mm -hmm. and all you do is grab it. They had instructions you grab the flag, stand six feet away from the track, and wave the flag at the same time. Mm -hmm. You just didn't stop. If you didn't see the flag, he kept going. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't have semi fours out there, because there was never an agent there. Yeah, it was just a stop. Let the people of conduct, conductor took care of the business. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And they would stop if they had to pick up freight or if they had to drop freight off. Well, I mean, no, or did they? No, they never dropped what we used to call L L C L freight. That's a carload. He mm -hmm. dropped that off at Richmond or Schmitz Creek. Oh, okay. It wasn't. It wasn't an important enough stop to no. to do that kind of work. No, it, was there. it wasn't a big enough place people. for it. People. That's yeah. all. Just people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when was that depot built, approximately? Do you well, know? according to Harry Liverance, who used to live down here, he worked for me when I was foreman at Smith Creek, and he started in 1928. And he says around 1900, that was built 1910, something like that. Yeah. That they pulled right there. Yeah. And that re that little community there where the depot was and, and the uh, elevator and the general store, uh, that was called Hickey, wasn't it? Oh, well, it was Hickey, Norm, from what I understand. Mm hmm. Because during World War One with Germany, they mm -hmm. changed the name from Hickey to Columbus. Ah, okay. Because German. Yeah, German. Uh, you, fighting uh, German. Fight, <laughs> they changed the name. Yeah. The Italians were on our side, weren't <laughs> yeah, they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you, 
That's where yeah. Italy's always been, Nora. Yeah. They ride the fence. See, mm -hmm. they tell you, he, Mussolini <laughs> thought they was going to win, so he, he, he joined. He, he, joined he joined the Germans. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let's see here. Um, well, uh, there's some other things there. There's, uh, there's a speeder, motorized cart at the depot, and, uh, and we have a, a pump car. Now, you had an interesting story oh, about that the, pump car. Yeah, you, 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 know. you said something about you had a speeder that you were using. and, and Yeah, well, happened. I had, I had a, a bigger car than what you have right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. It was a five-man car. Okay. That speeder's only a man, two-man car. Okay. Usually one man rides it. Mm -hmm. Well, I had this five-man car, and I had a, it was a, a big motor car. Mm hmm So one day it broke down, of course. The old man always played me, and this is still Mr. Zoli. Mm hmm You know, he said, you young kids, you know, <laughs> of course, him being an old man, he said, you young kids, you're always racing that big car out. You're pulling too much weight. We put 50, 50 ties on the, uh -huh. on the car and we'd go. Mm -hmm. He said, that's too much. Well, I was going to make two trips. I had to put 100 ties a day in. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. It was eight ties per man per day. And in the summer, we used to build the gang up. In the winter, I had five men. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I had to put, in the summer we built a gang up, so come up to, to eight ties a day, close to 100 ties, oh my God. So I, I'd load that old pump car, not the pump car, the motor car up with two lorries behind it. And I run it out. Of course, I knew where the trains was coming, you know, mm -hmm. and I knew I had sightings. And I'll tell you, in my day, Norm, a freight train run on time. Now they call them five hours later to run it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I, we could run on time. And he said, you wreck my cars all the time. You wreck it. So one day, <laughs> I happened to car and blew the engine. Mm -hmm. And I called up Detroit. 131 was left yet. Woodward 22260, I don't forget those numbers. I used to go to the elevator, call them up. Mm -hmm. I said, Dominic, I don't have a motor car. And I used to run from Port Yarn here to Richmond, where the old slaughterhouse, Pound Road. That was my yeah, territory. Yeah, yeah the week's, week's, yeah. week's slaughterhouse. That was, that was my territory. Yeah. I said, well, I got to have a car. And I had a patrol on Mondays. Because we had a patrolman during the week. He had, he had, uh, he could work Saturday, but Sunday and Monday he had off. Mm -hmm. Because that was his weekend. Mm -hmm. And you had to run that railroad, had to be patrolled at least every 48 hours. Looking for any kind of yeah. uh, defects in the track yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So he says, well, I'll tell you what to do, boy. He says, go in the Switch Creek Depot. He says, and there's a pump car in there. I said, I know there's a pump car in there. He said, until I get that one fixed, he says, pump it. <laughs> and I thought to myself, yeah, I, I, I don't like to call them names, but I said, you want me to pump that? He said, yep. He said, you pump it. I said, but I got 14 miles to run. He said, that's the problem, isn't it? He said, maybe try, next time you'll take care of your motor car. I said, well, all right. Well, I pumped it for four days a week. Mm -hmm. I, say, I pumped mm -hmm. it. And I'll tell you, Norm, that's not a freewheeling car. You pump it, you go downhill, that handle will still go up and down. 
He said, you're going uphill, <coughs> you'll break your back trying to go up. And I never pulled more than three ties on the damn thing. <laughs> oh, yes. you, I think you said something about you had to get off and push. Oh, oh you, you, go up, you go up that hill right there with Columbus, uh -huh. where you're going up to where the township hall is over Bell River. Yeah. You ain't going to pull no load up there, I'll tell yeah. you. That doesn't seem like that's uh, that steep a grade, but if you're hand pumping a car, I guess oh, that is. Oh, it's a steep a grade. Yeah. I should have brought my books, Norm. Mm -hmm. it, it'll tell you what grade it is. I have literature on all the railroad, our railroad. Mm -hmm. Got books in there, how deep the curve is and how how steep the what it is. Yeah. is you, you got a bad one here in Richmond. Now, Richmond is not bad because the curve we got going across Main Street, she runs from there to New Haven. You you start coming up hill at 27 mile road. Yeah, this is the high end of the county. Yeah, that that's great for for uh, for the railroad yeah. on this we call Mount Clemens Sub. Yeah. They they get they have the grade for that, and when they say we got to put put 20 cars on there, or 50 cars, and they figure the tonnage they, for Richmond, that's that's the steepest they got. Yeah. And they'll cut, no, you can't do that. You can pull 20, you're not gonna pull 25. Now, when I say 20 and 25, in my day, a 50, 50 car train was a long train. Oh my, they had two engines on it. Uh huh. But now, you run 200 cars, you know, because I have a grandson that's a train master. Mm -hmm. And he caught heck one time because he run a train less than two miles long. You know, if they got the freight, we go up to two miles. Too long, oh, wow. And that's... I've always wondered how long those trains could well, it be. It goes by grade on the subdivision. Yeah. Okay. You figure the grade. Figure the grade is how much yeah. how much you could pull. Yeah. It's so, because sometimes I've set it at a crossing and and waited a long time for oh, a train to get through. Yeah. Norm, when I when I was working here in Richmond, in that a fifty car train was a long train, mm -hmm. and it had two engines on them. Now that was two steam engines. Yeah. And the 50 car train was a long train. Yeah. And then don't forget, or a 50 car train, when I was working on the railroad, that was 35 foot cars. Then they come to the double car, box cars, that's all these, we call them tri levels. They're 100 foot long. Oh yeah, yeah. The cars yeah. have lengthened, yeah, haven't they're they? Yeah, they're hundred foot long. Yeah. And I, it, it, when <laughs> I went down to Detroit, we switch engines down there. We had curves so bad that you couldn't run a big locomotive oh, on it. That's right. You yeah. had short ones. Yeah, if you have too too tight a curve, yeah, you can, you can't run a big yeah, long car no, on it. No, you could run. It. That brings me another story, Norm. <laughs> when I went down to Brush Street, we was running, I had all them passenger trains. Uh -huh. And I was out there one day at Wood, Woodbridge Avenue. Uh -huh. You might have heard it on television because that's where all the bars are now because mm -hmm. they took all that stuff out. They got all these bars, Rye Pellets, a bar and all that. Mm -hmm. They're nice nightclubs now, you know. Yeah. And I was standing over there, clearing the train. It was number 64. It was a steam engine. It was going to Muskegon. And I was standing there at Woodbridge, and that steam engine goes around that thing, and they're going, it just starts to slow up. To go to the big curves go to town, and I see that track go this way, and I see the track go that way. She moved norm, I bet you, two inches. 
Move the track. Yeah. So I had to, to I put a stop order. Here you go by. Never derailed. Never. Mm -hmm. Everything was normal. I said, call the dispatch. Not the dispatcher, the yardmaster. I said, don't run no more trains over Woodbridge. Mm -hmm. He said, why? I said, I ain't got time to talk now. I got to go see the roadmaster. So I went to see Dominic. I said, Dominic, there's something wrong with Woodbridge. I said, try, okay. And he, his office was in the depot upstairs. Mm -hmm. Of course, my office was right across from his. I was outside. I was in the depot. I had a shanty. Mm -hmm. He said, come on, let's go see. He goes out there, here comes the train. He's coming down there. He said, what's the matter? I said, look at the track. He said, what's the matter for you? He said, how'd that big train go get around there? He said, they're pushing the track out, puts it back in. Of course, he was supposed to slow speed down there. Yeah. 15 miles an hour. Yeah. He wasn't going 60, he was going 15 miles an hour. He said, dummy. He said, look, at you know, you got that big engine, 100 foot long, big driver, you got to move the track. <laughs> I said, okay, I learned something. He said, don't you ever forget it. <laughs> no, I don't think you would, would you? Oh, my God. But I was scared, Norm. I well, ran yeah. all the way. Well, you see the track move, and you yeah. don't expect it to move. No, i never seen such a thing. But yeah. you, you, can you imagine what the heck, a big steam engine? Yeah. And that 64 had two 6,500 engines on them. The one that, remember the ones that was here in Richmond when they had that last train, that big steam? Yeah, yeah. That's one of the trains. And that, okay, that's that was a big engine, yeah. 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 Uh, and something that we talked about is it being at crossings and whatnot. It reminds me of the, the crossing signal that we have at the village there. Uh, oh, the wiggly wag? Yeah. We call them wiggly wags. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's... Now, those things operated off batteries, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. They operated... Of course, didn't that... They converted it, you know, but it, it was operated on batteries. Initially, they were operated on batteries. And they yeah, had Edison a fairly, batteries. Edison batteries. battery door and like that. Yeah, and we've and we've got one in yeah. the de in the depot, and if I remember correctly, you said something about those batteries had to be changed out every day or two days no. or something or what it was. Uh, it was sometimes that batteries, you know, we have a signal department, mm -hmm. and they run in this area at that time. They run from Armada to Richmond. To Smith's Creek. Mm -hmm. This is a maintainer. Mm -hmm. Well, he went out there once a week and checked the batteries. And that batteries all in. We had battery wells all the way along the railroad. And he went out there and had water in there. He put oil on top. And mm -hmm. they put their chemical, mm -hmm. their glass batteries. You can see mm -hmm. you got one. Yeah. And he just checked them out. And then she go. They, they must fail proof though. Uh, well, how long would they they last before they had to be recharged? He once a week he goes. Once a to, week. Yeah, he go once in there. a week. And he'd pull that out, put yeah. another one in. Yep. Yeah. And then get well, that. Well, he one. would. He would just take the top off it, pour more chemical. He checked it. It take the oil out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. He gotcha. dump oil in there. Yeah. Or, and the chemical, I don't know what kind of chemical it was. It's an acid, probably. Yeah, it's an acid. Yeah. And we use, I remember Edison, I think you got one. I think so, yeah. And if you don't, I have one whole. Okay. But there's Edison little batteries, a little water, oil junk like that, you just pour them in there. And that keeps them from evaporating, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That would seal off the top of it. Yep. Yeah. How come you to uh, donate the depot to the Historical Society? Well, Norm, the wife was interested in the depot. Mm -hmm. And when I moved it, 
she did most of the work out there. Mm -hmm. She painted it and she kept it clean. And by that time, I brought the caboose and I had the engine and all that. Mm -hmm. So then it got it got bad. And Mr. Evans, which was the real estate company and and uh, insurance company over here, he come over to my place one day. He said, Joe. He says, you got the caboose, you got the engine there. He said, you got that that pond right there. You had a museum going, basically, yeah. right? Yeah. He says, you know, he says, I know the kids are jumping off that caboose into that pond. He said, you know what liability you got there? I said, I never thought of that. He said, well, you got a lot of liability. And I said, he said, your homeowners isn't going to take care of that. I said, okay. I said, I'll take care of that. How much is it going to cost? And I forget what it was, Norm. It was way beyond my means for liability. I yeah. Think. So then I says, well, I'll think about it. He said, we better not think too long. And they were jumping. You know, we weren't around. They were jumping out mm -hmm. into my pond. I said, okay. So wife and I got talking about it. She said, well, simple. She says, get rid of your engine. Get rid of your caboose. He said, and... We're going to get rid of the depot. I says, no, we're not going to get rid of the depot. I says, I'm going to make a chicken coop out of it. <laughs> I said, I can get rid of all the stuff because I collected a lot of stuff. Bro. Yeah, you can yeah, see. Yeah, I know. And you know I had a lot more than that. Oh, yeah. At one time, I had 14 motor cars. Wow. I bought them for three cents a ton, at three cents a pound. Yeah. But she said, no, no. She says, well, you, and then I was talking to, uh, who was that? George? George. Yeah. Yeah, George there. And I said, George, I said, well, you ought to do something with this. And they, they was talking about this historical time. They was talking about moving to school and all that. Mm -hmm. I says, how'd you like a depot? He says, the one you got? I said, yeah. I says, if you want it, I'll give it to you. I said, because my mother-in-law, my wife says, we're never going to give rid of that depot. You know, anything but someplace like the museum or something mm -hmm. like that because my mother used to ride that thing yeah. every there for four years she got there on sunday and got off you know yeah. on friday or vice versa yeah i said well that's all right i said i talked to to george because i know they was talking about it you know and i says i'll give you that thing you want it well, let's think about it. We got to find a place to put it. You know, they were mm -hmm. just in the, just started your historical society. Mm -hmm. They had, had it was just talk. Yeah. So I says, okay, we'll do that. So then I got rid of my engine, and I I got rid of my deep of uh, my uh, caboose, mm -hmm. and that. And I wish I'd have kept that to give it to you guys. That would have been really something, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The engine would have been a little harder to move, but the caboose, I could have moved it. Yeah. But it, anyway, and we worked how many years? Finally, I told them, hey, I got people who'll take it. Mm -hmm. If you guys don't want it, I said, we got to get rid of it. Yeah. Because... The paint start failing, you know, 
Your wife got tired of painting. Yeah, the upkeep. Yeah, yeah for you guys. Much. You guys were getting up in age a little yeah. bit, and oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I used to have no. Well, the depot was sitting there. I had schools come out there. You know, they'd come out and show the schools and everything else. Mm -hmm. Had buses late. <laughs> around, around, well, you had the, you had couldn't get around, around. Well, you had a museum. You had a railroad museum. Yeah, that was yeah. a unique thing. Yeah, yeah. So, in the, I when I seen something normal had anything to do with the railroad. As long as it didn't cost more than a dollar, you you yeah. grabbed it, right? <laughs> and I had to figure out how to get it home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I know I donated the wife and I. Mm -hmm. Not me. The wife and I, we donated for the Mount Clemens. They got a, they started their, their museum down there. Mm -hmm. so all them carts and all that, that was mine. Mm -hmm. The one in uh, Emily City, k Pack has even got some of my stuff over there. I, really, yeah. I donated all, the wife and I, I keep saying I am sorry. But the wife and I mm -hmm. donated a lot of stuff to mm -hmm. them, just so they kept it, mm -hmm. you know, just like we did with yous. Yeah. It, well, we really appreciate it at the well, Historical Society we, having that stuff. We wanted to see the, and we both love the railroad. Yeah. You know, all my wife when they shipped me out of town, but <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it, it was a good experience, though, and, and I wanted to see Richmond get it. Yeah, it's it's a piece of local you, it's a piece of local history. And, yeah, and uh, I'm glad it was done before my wife passed. Yes, you know. yes. So, but yeah. she she wanted that depot because her mother rode that train, and that mm -hmm. we wasn't going to destroy it. She'd have mm -hmm. kept the depot there, nor by itself. Mm -hmm. She'd have kept that painted, but I had to get rid of all that other junk. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't want to cut grass around my motor cars. She used to do all that. She yeah. enjoyed cutting grass and yeah. stuff, but she used to do it. Yeah. And I talked to boys. And yeah. Well, it's again, it's it's been a nice uh, addition to the village there, and we really appreciate it. And we glad to see it. Every time my grandkids come here, my great-grandkids, and they go up there, and they see the depot, and they tell their friends, that used to blow my grandma and grandpa. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it's just, it's. It, yeah. Well, it's it's been very enjoyable talking to you about all of this, and it's an important piece of local history. It seemed like I was talking about myself, Norm. <laughs> well, I don't have the answers. I only have the questions. So, but we really appreciate you you taking the time to do this. Well, I appreciate you guys yeah, asking. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll go into the depot now and see what's what's inside the depot. So, it's been very nice talking to you so far. We're, conclude in the inside the depot. Joe. Good old claw bar. Claw bar. Claw bar. Pull a spice with that thing. Yeah. And then yeah. you pinch the rail, you have to pinch it up. Pinch it back and forth yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. This thing's heavy. That's a heavy. That's one of the reasons, Lord, I didn't want to. Remember I told yeah. you about? No, how about to get out of here? Yeah, you wanted to get you, you, you all use your brain long. instead of using yeah, your yes. back, right? Well, okay. Now, another device right here. Good old track gate. 56 and a half inches. Yeah, this you, would be to keep... To yeah, make you put this down on the rail. Like that. Mm -hmm. And bring it down. Mm -hmm. It's a better fit there. So th this is so that the, the rails would always be the right yeah, distance it's apart. Yeah, 56 and a half inch. Yeah, that's pretty cool. You said something about a person that could use that, got an extra... Use that for jacket. Mm -hmm. We had the big heavy jacket, you see mm -hmm. what they do. Yeah. I believe you got one. Yeah. And then use did, that for lining. Did, did, a, did a guy that that was able that ran this thing make a little extra money well that track gauge if you if you do use that mm -hmm. and you use this thing here a spike ball mm -hmm. you made 10 cents more an hour they call that gauge spiker 
And that. So what you got here is a is a couple of different kinds of balls. Yeah, that, that's that's a ball wall. We call that ball. See, they're both the same. Mm -hmm. and, and that one there. Yeah, it's a, it's a slightly different shape. Yeah. You use this for gazing track. You use this one here, setting frogs and stuff like that. Okay. All righty. I'm going to set them. They're both heavy, though. Yeah, they are. And then we got another little device here. Oh, that was a chicker. You use that, Lord, mm -hmm. to put your grease and your filler in there for your rail. Mm -hmm. Your axles, mm -hmm. you use that. And yes. you use this over here, or yeah. when, the, when the man come up there, he would grab the cover of your axle, uh -huh. pick it up. And, and then you could get grease in there. Yeah. yeah. So this is you help to use it to pick, open up and to yeah. expose the open up. Where, where And that one there is the chicken. Okay. Chicken around the axle. Okay. Because all I had was brass in there, a brass mm -hmm. cover. She mm -hmm. come like that, mm -hmm. and that was, it had the oil packed in the bottom. And when that went down, or we call that a hot box, you could see a train burning. Well, that was one of it's my understanding, that's one of the reasons for the caboose and that cab that was up yeah, on top. Yeah, he stood up there, and he walked for hot boxes. He looked down the side, yeah. and the guy looked down the other side, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and I think the engineers yeah. probably glanced back yeah. every once in a while, yeah. too. So but I see him burning on him, and I see him smoking. When they start smoking, that's when you got to watch out. Yeah. Because you're going to break an actual... Well, a derailed train, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. When you see a derailed train, yeah. half of my derailment experience was on a hot box. I'll be she done. derailed a train, and I've seen as far as 35, 40 cars go off. Oh, wow. Wow. Now, you were, since we're talking about lubrication and whatnot. Yeah, that was, that was a lubrication. And Usually the engineer used that. Because mm -hmm. he had bearings, of course. In them days, we didn't have to worry about. In them days when this was used, we had steam. Mm -hmm. You had a lot of places to grease. And so this thing has a long spout, so you yeah. don't have to bend over, yeah, right? You just, you just there, reach in. You fill them little cups up. There. Yeah. He had all those little cups and whatnot. Yeah. Now, on track, I, when I was growing up, I thought all track was the same size. All the rails were the same size. Well, this well, obviously shows this, some differences. When I was at Pontiac, I had this made. This is the kind of rail I had. This was on the Cass City saw. That 56 and a half pound. Then we graduated 56 and a half pound. We went to 68 pound. Now, for our, for our guys that are that are watching this, uh, what do you mean when you say 50 or 60? That's uh, uh, every yard. For every yard. Every yard. Every, every three feet, that's yeah. how much that would weigh. And obviously, as this goes up... And it, this, is, this is 130 pounds. 130 pounds for a three-foot section. Yeah. Wow. And this was... All the rail that I had, mainline rail on my territory. Mm -hmm. And the heavier rails would be able to handle heavier trains? Oh, my goodness. We went, you could run a 5900 engine on that. Mm -hmm. Even though that was in the sidetrack. Yeah. But right about here is where you started. To, when you come out to 90, 100 pound, mm -hmm. yeah, then you start running these big, big engines. Yeah, and the, and the heavier the engine, the more train it could pull, yeah, right? Yeah, okay. All right. Now, the communications between uh, uh, various depots and whatnot, a lot of times was done with uh, we had the telegraph? Use, no, the Cass City sub, the last sub that we had that had telegraph, mm -hmm. that's the only communication you had. Okay. Telegraph, Al Smell Telephone. By the time you came around, though, they were probably going to telephone more. Yeah, yeah. This is the last one we had. Okay. Yeah. All right. And 
This would be the agent's office inside right. here. Right. And uh, he'd have various stamps that he would use to have to stamp various things, Ooh. sell your tickets. There was different kind of, you know, paid, so on and so forth. Okay. Word scored. Okay. There was kind of stamps. All right. And uh, these little tools right here are used to stamp ticket tickets. Ticket agent. That's a ticket. The conductor. The conductor. The ticket agent, it's your ticket. He'd get on the train, he'd punch it with that. Punch it with that. Yeah. Okay. And there was different designs for the punching and so on. And this is an example of, of a ticket uh, that would be used and has the prices along the side that you yeah. might punch out or whatever. And the conductor would sign off on this. Yeah, and he he'd have to have that in when he got. Okay, yeah. and on the back of this, they had the the prices. Yeah. Between the how much money it cost? How much money it cost to go from one place to another? Right. Okay, so uh, if you were going from what Port Huron, Port Huron. to Brush Street, it'd be about a dollar forty-five. If I'm yeah. reading this right, okay. All right, big money, huh? All right, and to keep one of the other things that we have here is this bent piece here. Well, that that's a transmission transmitter. What he would do, he'd get his orders. Mm -hmm. A trade would get his orders, like you see over there. He had it on that. He put the yellow flag up, mm -hmm. and that'd be sold on. I got the message for you. He'd hold that out like that. The engineer put his arm right through it, take that off. And throw this back on the ground. Throw it back on the ground. The agent go pick it up. Yeah. Train so order is, transmission. Yeah, okay, so this is a, yeah, transmission. Yeah, the yeah. paperwork. Yeah. Stop okay. at Columbus. We got a car for you to move. Yeah. And, and you were talking also about sometimes, you know, as a whistle stop, they would yeah. just throw a mail bag out. So yeah. it might be a mail bag, something like this. And they would toss he, it he, off. They, they would eat them off on the fly. He mm -hmm. would go to, he had that arm come out like yeah, that. Yeah. He'd throw it on there and that arm would come back. Yeah. Wow. Now, here's another tool here. Yeah, that's another tool that maybe be a supervisor. So I wasn't going to handle that all day. You're picking up 125 pounds of towel with that. So you're picking up ties. Uh, ties. up 100. Average a hundred pounds, maybe a little more, hundred twenty-five. Now, did, did a guy, yeah. one guy, grab it yeah. like this, or was sure it two did. guys? Then you just turn it around, boy. Turn it upside down. Turn it like this. Now that's a two-man. That's a two-man. The other direction? Yeah. No, okay. you got you and okay. I grab that. Okay. Come around like that. We shrink it around, boy. Got my kid. Shrink it right around, boy. Okay. Got it? All right. I've dropped. Watch your hand. Now you uh, grab a timber. Okay, grab two men. Two men. Okay, so the other way was for one man, and yeah. this is for two men. Yeah. Okay, I got gotcha. you. That's pretty cool. Now one of the other things here, this would normally we don't we don't look put this out until so we way. have an event or something. This you goes on top. Green of the for a line straight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's coming. He sees green. He says, "All right." You turn that. Okay. It's just like you turn your flag and turn the right. Engineer, you better slow down or he's going over. Now, this is kerosene, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. We fill them up every three days. Every three days? Yeah. Okay. Did that run all, that ran all day, all night? Yeah, yeah, she, she caught them for three days. Okay. All righty. Now we have some other artifacts that aren't necessarily railroad related here. It's a wheel. Well, that that character is from Brush Street Depot. Does it come from Brush? Yeah, Brush Street Depot. Okay. All right. Was this something the railroad had for passengers, or was that, this well or for what? passengers? Okay. He beat the train. Mm -hmm. Take them off. Okay. All right. All right. I didn't. I didn't know that. It was something new yeah. for me. Okay. And then this is a depot stove. Yeah, that's a regular depot stove. Yeah. That's a good stove. Yeah. That stove there comes from uh, Kingo Harbor. Okay. 
it's a nice little stove. You can, you, you can well, put your coffee on top here. The yeah. mistake I made, Norm, was I took the stove out of here. It was a flat stove. Mm -hmm. It was a regular railroad stove. And I brought it to Richmond Sportsman Club. Yeah. They stole it. Somebody stole it. Yeah, somebody yeah. stole it. Yeah, that's a shame. That's yeah. a shame. I had this from uh, Kingo Harbor. Mm -hmm. and I brought it over there. Okay. Now, what about like this? Well, that side, that one there, or mm -hmm. that would be in a depot like maybe Richmond. Yeah. I know it would be in Mount Clements. Okay. But Richmond, a big depot. Be in a big depot, yeah. not one like this. No. And so. That was advertising. And, okay. And I had the opportunity to pick them up. And I put, there's a railroad I really enjoyed, the Peel and then. And I took that railroad. And that, that one there, we took that one there. And it was the uh, ruling structure gave it to me. I said, what do you do with this, Joe? He said, well, I'm going to give it to the museum. I said, well, hand it to me. Mm -hmm. He said, you can have it, Joe, but you can't sell it or anything else. Mm -hmm. As long as you take it to the museum. Yeah. He said, you can take it. And I kept it in mind. And yeah. I got, that's how they tell them. See the train orders up there yeah, yeah. and all that? Yeah. That's how they used to run. Mm -hmm. Piece of paper. So and I always got a great kick on one of those desks in there. I think it is. The train number, so and so, run wild. Mm -hmm. In other words, you could work out there, but watch out for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Okay, we had an order to tell you what you could do. The only time you cleared timetable was a passenger train. Okay. You didn't get the order. You knew he was coming there, and you were going to be out of his way. Yeah. Now, here's another thing right here. <coughs> you wouldn't find this in the depot. This is it would be in a railroad car. Caboose. Right? In the caboose? That was a caboose. And it's made, it's yeah. got some flexibility to it yeah. so that going up and down the tracks and whatnot, yeah. it's, it's going to keep it from spilling, so yeah. to speak. Okay. Now, one of the other things that that you talked to me about are things like these batteries. Yeah, that, that was like I remember batteries. Yeah. Now I think you got one in the other room. I was Edison battery. They, I might. Yeah. But one of the things that people don't realize is that there was so much of this stuff that was just of your equipment, whatnot, electric equipment, that was run by battery. Oh yeah. The, this whole place was run. That telegraph. Telegraph run by it, battery. It's all battery. Phone, my phone, and, and yeah. everything else was run by battery. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, we don't think about yeah. that, but they ran an awful lot of things off, yeah. off of battery. So, uh, I don't know that we got, oh. Well, there's some torpedoes up there. I was just going to, I just saw them. There are a couple of torpedoes up yeah. there, like this one right here and then over on the wall there. Yeah. Now, a tor you know, usually when you say torpedo, for most people nowadays, they think of the submarine as being part yeah, of that. That's what we call torpedo. But go back to the time of the Civil War, for example, yeah. any kind of a mine or explosive, you know, type thing was meant to blow stuff up, was a lot of times referred to as a torpedo. Yeah. And these were what? Placed well, on the rails. The rules was, if you went out as a flagman, or you went on that motor car, mm -hmm. On the motor car, you had to have 12 torpedoes. Okay. A yellow and a red flag. Okay. Now, all of a sudden you see a train coming, and you know a train coming and you can't get out of his way, you put two torpedoes on him. A mile away. You okay. know, like you're putting in time. Yeah, yeah. If a train comes, you hear that two torpedoes, he slows train down. If you heard one, he put her in a big hole. He knew there was trouble up there. Better stop her right okay. now. Okay, all right. And, uh, so two meant slow down, yeah. one meant stop, stop right now. Stop right now. Stop right now, okay. I used that quite a bit though when I get in trouble between Port Huron and Swiss Creek. 
and I couldn't get the motor car. I know I had a load of ties, mm -hmm. so I shut off two torpedoes. Uh-huh. And they give me time to get some crazy He hit those, he slowed off and he he hit only go fifteen miles an hour. Okay. And he can only go as fast as he could stop his train within half the distance. Okay. So he slowed right down. Slowed right down. Okay. I'm looking around to see if there's anything else that we need to talk about here, but I think we I think we basically covered this side. Uh, and so thank you very much, Joe, for for explaining these things. I know our audience is going to yeah. appreciate it. So. Just give me a quick uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us today. I would appreciate you viewing this thing, and uh, we enjoyed it. Mm -hmm.